Hello, and welcome to episode two of CS888. So, I hope that you've all had an interesting first few weeks and have had an opportunity to read through some of the papers uh, about stereopsis and stereo viewing. If you are one of the individuals who elected to present one of the papers from this section, please make sure that you get your video or a link to your video posted to Piazza over the next few days. And we already have one video that has been posted and it's wonderful and make sure that you watch it and uh, provide some feedback and also ask some questions of our lovely first presenter. The other thing I wanted to mention is that with most grad courses, as I'm sure you were aware, enrollment tends to go up and go down and go up and go down as people decide which is the best courses for them to take to manage their own research needs with whatever workload that they have. Uh, and so while we started out with a very full group, we are now down to about 10, which actually comes into effect with respect to how many presentations we've asked you to view. So since we're down to about 10, obviously you're not going to be able to view 24 presentations. So we're down to 20 presentations now. And don't worry, I will adjust whatever grading scheme to be appropriate to the number of individuals that are actually enrolled. And if you haven't signed up to present any papers, please do take an opportunity to sign up now. Um, that way we'll have a good idea as to the spread of how many people are presenting in each particular topic. And if you want to present more, um, then don't be afraid to drop me an email and I'm more than happy to adjust grading schemes for anyone who wishes to present more papers. And of course, as always, your paper reviews, which there are two for each of the four groups, make sure that you email those to me as well. And the form, of course, is available on Piazza too. So our first episode was discussing um, the basics of what stereo is and how we would view stereo content. And this episode here today serves as an introduction for the next section of papers, which is discussing conversion, that is 2D to 3D conversion, but also discussing disparity maps and how to make them and manipulate them. Now, we already talked about conversion in our last episode, so I'm not going to reiterate that particular topic. But what I'd like to do today is I'm going to introduce you to a few tools first that you may find very, very useful for reading some of these papers, but also useful for the project. And then I'd like to go into a discussion of what disparity maps are and how you can actually create disparity maps and some of the challenges that exist with the production of these disparity maps. Um, and if nobody has signed up for the paper, and I, I don't have it open here right now, uh, about adjusting disparity in post, even if it's not one you want to present a review, I, and maybe this is a bit of a shameless plug for a paper I wrote, uh, but I recommend you read it because it's actually, it seems like a very complicated idea that's actually quite simple. Um, and the, the method that's used in that paper will actually become useful in the next section of the course as well. But that's entirely up to you if you'd like to, uh, to read that one. All right, so. Let uh, me show you a few tools first then that we have that will be helpful. So the first, and I've already posted a link to this on Piazza, is Stereo Photo Maker. Now, Stereo Photo Maker is a tool that I've been using probably for the last eight to 10 years. And it is a tool that lets you manipulate stereo 3D photos and adjust various parameters with them. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't have an explicit 64-bit edition for Mac OS Catalina, but they do have a beta version where they want you to uh, use Wine64 to run the Windows version. So I'm on Catalina, and I'm going to show you a Stereo Photo Maker uh, using Catalina and Wine. And you'll notice, yes, I was killing it earlier, and that's because it... Um, it's very buggy. There are some things we can't do with it. Uh, but if you have a Windows installation, uh, you should have no problems whatsoever uh, running this. So let's open up Stereo Photo Maker here. Now, it's a very 
simple window and uh, it lets you open different types of stereo images. There are many different stereo image formats. So um, you can have the left and right images stored separately and you can open them that way. Or if you have something like the 3D camera or I've downloaded three images of the internet, you can also find side-by-side -side formats, top-bottom formats, and then the format that I use most often is known as an MPO. And that is the default format of the Fuji camera. Although it is quite popular and many TVs and 3D devices actually understand that format. So I don't have an MPO right on hand here today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open left, right images. Now, this is a photo that I did take with the Fuji. Um, so I'm going to select my left image. And the tool is fairly intuitive in the sense that if you select the left one and it has like an underscore L in the file name, it can usually figure out that the one that has the same file name with the underscore R is your right image. So we'll open the left. And then it's going to ask you, hey, is this the correct right image? And indeed, that is for me the correct right image, so I'll confirm that. And there we go, there's the stereo pair, and we're viewing them side by side. Now, what we can do is there's different ways that you can view the content. So it's interlaced, gray. Um, we can view these as um, uh, anaglyph of different types. So there's uh, color anaglyph, half-color anaglyphs, Dubois, um, all kinds of different ways that you can actually view the anaglyph image. And this, uh, this little tool actually lets you save the image in pretty much any one of these formats that you see listed here that you can view them in. So if we wanted to switch this to an anaglyph view, so this is the adjustment view where you can kind of see the two images overlaid on top of each other, but that's not the view I want to have. I want to have, uh, there's my anaglyph view. So this is a color anaglyph view. Now, why is this tool particularly useful? What you should note here, looking at this particular image, is that the left and right are really far apart. So when I started taking these stereo photos, I had no idea what I was doing. Somebody at Adobe had simply said, here, here's a 3D camera. You should go get some new content for your research. And so without knowing much about what does it take to take, what does it take in order to get a good stereo photo, I just went around uh, California taking random pictures with this stereo camera, completely not knowing what I was doing. I got my finger in half the images, so on and so forth. And then of course, you're so not accustomed to using a camera that has two lenses that you think nothing about rotating and taking a portrait photo, which of course doesn't work for a stereo camera. Obviously I know a lot more about how to take a stereo picture now. But this is one of the photos that sort of works, but it has a really large separation. And you can see it here looking at the corners of this rose here. They are, at least on my screen, over an inch apart. Now, the general rule is that you, and this is something that, uh, if you read any books about stereo filmmaking, you don't want this to exceed about two or three percent of your screen width. So this is way, this would be considered way too much separation, way too much disparity. Um, now, what is this going to cost for you? So I really do recommend that you download this tool and I will post to Piazza, of course, a number of stereo images for you to work with and open it up and you can create, now I would create the wiggle brand for you here but unfortunately it crashes on Catalina to create the Wigglegram. But if you're in Windows, you can create the Wigglegram in Windows, no problem, through Stereo Photo Maker. What a Wigglegram is, is it's going to alternate left, right, left, right at a particular frame rate that is going to give you the illusion of depth. And this is a really great way to actually view stereo content if you don't have a pair of anaglyph glasses at home or a stereo 3D screen. Now, of course, I have anaglyph classes, and the extra monitor that's sitting beside me is also a stereo 3D screen, so. Um, but I still use wiggle grams. Uh, if you're wondering why I still use wiggle grams, it's because I'm stereo blind, and using anaglyph glasses does nothing for me. So the wiggle gram is actually a really useful thing. So what I want to do here is I want to show you a technique uh, that's really common in uh, working with stereo 3D, and that is to adjust the separation. Now, when I'm going to adjust the separation here, I'm not reducing the depth in the scene. We're keeping the range of depth actually the same. I'm just going to push it. 
either in front of the screen or I'm going to push it behind the screen a little bit to make the area of focus a bit more comfortable to view. This does not solve problems where you have too much separation. You're still going to have too much separation in the image, but now we're just pushing it to somewhere where we care less about. And unfortunately, while there are other techniques to actually reduce the depth, the paper I suggested, um, this method that I'm about to show you is actually more common than not in industry because it's so cheap and so easy and you don't need a disparity map to do it. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to go into adjust and then we're going to hit easy adjustment and it brings up this little pop-up window here and hopefully if I make this bigger it's not going to crash. And what I'm going to do here is at the top you can see this H position slider. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the two overlapping left and right images and we're going to move them like this until we've adjusted the separation to something that we deem comfortable for the region of interest. But what you'll note is that for other regions, so if we are moving something that's in front of the screen closer to the screen plane, then the objects behind the screen plane now become further apart. So I happen to know that I have to move this into about the 60, 50 range. So there we go. So what you can see is objects that were really far in the background are now really, really far apart. But the rows, which is the focal point of this particular image, by adjusting the separation is now much more comfortable to view. And in a lot of time when I'm working with this stereo photo, this is what I do. It doesn't solve the problem, it just shifts it away from the area of focus. So that's one thing that you can do with Stereo Photo Maker is push this region of interest into a region of depth which is a little bit more comfortable for viewing. Again, it does not eject, change the depth range. It just pushes it forward or pushes it backward. Now you can do some other things in here that we're going to talk about a little bit later today such as rectification, adjusting for barrel roll and keystoning which are problems that come up with uh, shooting converged which means that your camera lenses are actually angled inwards or outwards to focus on a particular object at a particular depth. That can cause keystoning and uh, you can also get barrel roll and various other problems with the images being aligned and this tool can actually help you to solve those problems. So that's actually pretty cool. And then if you hit OK, it adjusts it in your main view. Now when you do this adjustment of the separation just by uh, moving the images closer or further apart in their overlap, you're going to be trimming off the edges. Because what's going to happen if you don't trim off the left and right edges, as we'll see a little later today, is you're going to end up with a large region of your left view not having any matches in the right view, which is not a natural thing for the human visual system. I mean, yes, there are things in your left view that don't match with your right view just because your left eye can see more to the left than your right one, but the amount that the image is going to create for you is going to be very uncomfortable and it's going to create some, some serious discomforts. And in industry, we have ways of dealing with this. We call them window violations, objects that go off the edge. We would cut them out. Um, and I think maybe what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start posting some extra content uh, just to get you more into how are some other stereo problems being solved. And I'll post these extra things to Piazza over the coming weeks. Okay, so we've adjusted this stereo photo and then of course we can save it. Now, if I try to save the Wigglegram, it's not going to work. I can't even open the menu up. Uh, this is as far as I can get. Uh, but with the, when you make the animation GIF, that will make you a GIF that alternates between the two views and you could set the frame rate. Uh, you can save new left and right views. You can save it as an MPO file. You can save it as an anaglyph. So this tool here, Stereo Photo Maker, really is the champion stereo photo editing tool. Um, so if you are looking to work with any stereo images, I highly recommend that you download this tool. It's very free. I posted the link. Get some experience using it. It's a great, great tool. So I'm going to leave this here. Now, the next thing that you might be wondering, yes, I know, you can see all the errors, page faults, all of those lovely things. Um, because it's running through wine, right? Some Windows program in wine. 
So the other thing I want to point out to you is where do you get stereo content? So now that we're moving towards the end of May, you might be wondering, I would actually like to see some stereo images. Now, if we were in person, of course, we would have access to all of our wonderful 3D equipment in the lab. And unfortunately, since we're in, we don't have access to the lab, we won't be able to play with any of the fun toys. But you can still get access to stereo photos. So I will go through my own repo of stereo photos and I will post some, keeping in mind that they are some of the earliest stereo photos I have. So they're good examples of, well, there are some good photos in there, but there's also some photos in there that are good examples of what not to do which maybe that's something you want to address in your project, that's up to you. But the standard set of test images for stereo imaging is known as the lovely Middlebury data set. Now I have posted a link to this to Piazza already, and uh, this data set goes back to 2001. So they've got a set of images from 2001, 2003, 2005, 2006, and 2014. I have a tendency to use the ones from 2006 and back. What's really interesting about these particular ones, is I'm going to click on one here. Oh, some of them only have a couple images. Is that the one I want? 2005 tends to be one I use a lot of. So 2005, what you'll notice here is that for each of these 3D photos, and this is true for all of the data sets, so they're going to provide you with the left and the right views they're also going to provide you with the disparity map, which obviously is our focus of today. So we're going to be talking a little bit about these disparity maps. So they're providing you with what's known as a ground truth disparity map, which is not flawless, but it's pretty close to flawless. And whenever you are working with a stereo image, trying to do some kind of manipulation with it, that disparity map is a big requirement. Um, almost every method that we're going to talk about in the third section of the course is going to need some form of depth map or disparity map in order to operate. So Middlebury dataset has become exceptionally popular in stereo research because they have not only provided some lovely 3D images, they've also provided uh, the disparity maps that go with them. Now these pictures aren't the most interesting <laughs> disparity or images. Um, you've got this collection of dolls here. And then in the set I use most often, of course, we have given some of these images nicknames, which you may hear me refer to. For example, Baby 1 and Baby 2, we call Creepy Baby. Uh, and then Bowling, and we, we've given them various nicknames. Because they're not photos that you can normally take, they're just good test photos. So this is the de facto standard for um, stereo 3D test data. Now, there's other interesting things on the Middlebury website, but I'm going to leave that for now and we'll actually come back and talk about that in a minute. So, what I'd like to do now is switch over to our slides for today. And I want to talk more about these disparity maps. So, in particular, I want to mention that you can't live with them and you can't live without them. Now, I've already kind of alluded to the fact of why you can't live without them, and that is if you want to do any manipulation of a stereo image, you need the disparity map. <clears throat> and the reason why you need the disparity map is you want to make sure that however you are manipulating your stereo image, you're doing so consistently, which means that if I'm coloring the red apple in the foreground, in the left image, I need to make sure that I color the red apple in the right image in the foreground at the same time. So we need a way to match up the pixels of the left image to the pixels of the right image. And that's what the disparity map is going to give us. Now I say you can't live with them because as you're going to discover today, and as you read papers in this area, this is a particularly challenging problem and many of the disparity maps that are out there are really bad, really, really bad. All right. So let's just go back and review disparity. So I showed you this image before, and this is actually a ray traced image. And I pointed out, if you look at this candle wick for this foreground candle here, and you look at its position in the image, you'll notice that in the left image, that candle wick is closer to the left edge than that candle wick is in the right image. And what's interesting about this is if we were to look at the disparity 
of a pixel in that candle wick. So we're saying pixel XY in the candle wick has a disparity D. Well, that disparity D tells us where the corresponding pixel is in the right image. So pixel Q, which is that same pixel of the candle wick, but in the right image, is at X, which is the position of the one in the left image, minus D, and the same position along Y. So that disparity is actually being used to tell us where in the other image can you find this matching pixel. Now, if you're wondering how is the disparity related to the depth, uh, if you remember from our first episode, we saw that disparity is proportional to depth, uh, especially when you, and you need to know the baseline of the camera and the focal length of the camera. And that will tell you the actual depth. So disparity and depth are very closely related. Now, this means if the disparity can tell you how to go from left to right, then the disparity in the right can also tell you how to go from right to left. So you end up with this lovely little cycle here. So given a pixel in the left image and its disparity, you can find the corresponding pixel in the right by simply subtracting D from X. And then if that pixel was actually viewable in both images, that is, that is it's, it's, you can see it in both left and right views, then the disparity of that matching pixel in the right image, if you add D to X minus D, you end up with a position of that pixel in the left image. So what's interesting about this little relationship you're seeing here is that you can actually take, let's suppose you just have the left image and the left disparity map, you can actually produce the right image. Now it won't be complete, and I'll explain why in a minute, but what this is doing is you're doing a stereo warp. So you take the pixels of the left image and using the disparity, you warp them to the right image. Now, I said it's going to be incomplete, and the reason why the warped version would be incomplete is because your left eye and your right eye see slightly different images. There's that horizontal separation. And the real good example for this is, again, hold your hand out, arm's length, use your thumb to cover an object at a distance and close uh, after closing your one eye, and then when you switch eyes, you'll see that whatever your thumb was covering isn't covered anymore. So you're going to end up, if you do the stereo warp from left to right, you're going to end up with regions of the right image that are empty. And you end up with regions that are empty because those are the regions that were occluded in the left, so you have no data for them. And then, of course, you simply have to fill them in. And uh, one of the papers, or I think there might actually be two papers, in the third section of readings is actually about how do you actually do that filling in. And there's some wonderful people at Adobe who are doing research in that particular area. All right, so this is the basic idea of the disparity map. It's actually not that complicated. Now, if you're wondering where did this math arise from, if you remember that uh, epipolar geometry diagram we looked at in episode one, it's actually coming from that. All right, so here's the disparity pair. Now, most disparity algorithms are going to produce um, every, the background is going to be the screen plane. So in the background, that would be zero. And then you get disparities coming out of the screen. Um, now, that is not true for every algorithm, but this is the most common way that we do it is the furthest background is zero for no separation. And then all objects are coming out of the screen. Okay. So that's the disparity map. How do we get this? How do we create this disparity map? Now, this disparity map you see on this page, I'll revisit. This was actually ray traced. Um, most people aren't ray tracing their 3D photos. So how are we going to create it? So the one thing we know is that we have some pixel P that's in the left image. And I always go left to right, but it's very common to just go left to right. Um, we have some pixel in the left image, and we want to find which pixel in the right image matches. And there's one thing that we know for certain. Because our eyes are separated by a distance along x, 
We know, therefore, that the pixel we are searching for should be on the same scan line in the right image. So we're only going to vary x in our search. We're not going to vary y. So I want to find pixel p over here in the right image. Now, looking at this particular left and right image, it should be fairly obvious what the matching one is. So if this first row is A and the second row is B, then B4 in the left image matches to B2 in the right image. Because if we're scanning along here, we say, oh, there's the yellow pixel. So I've got a very the uh, quick bit of uh, code, pseudocode here. This is the scan line method for finding the disparity of a different pixel. That is finding the match. Now, if you're sitting there wondering, this problem looks very familiar, it's because this is the correspondence problem. However, it's just a subset of the correspondence problem because we don't need to search up or down to find where an object is moved. We're just looking left and right. So it's a subset. Doesn't mean it's any easier though. All right, so all we're going to do is literally starting, we've got this pixel here. So what we're going to do is along that same row of the right image, we are going to search. And when we find a pixel that matches, we are going to say that the difference in the X is going to be the disparity of that pixel. And that's it. We move on. So obviously, that probably seems very, very easy. So again, here's just a very brief search. So we'll start here. Now I like to, um, because I know that uh, objects are going to be coming out of the screen in my particular photos, I don't search left and right in my right disparity map. I'm only going to search to the left in the right image because the object is going to be more to the left in the left image. So this is a trick you can use for particular kinds of stereo images. So we start at the position uh, B4, and then as we move on here, then B4 was not yellow, so we move to B3, moving to the left, because we are looking for something that was in the left, so we're expecting it to be more towards the left. So we look then at B3, and then finally B2, and there's our match. We subtract 2 from 4, and that gives us our disparity of 2. Easy, right? So here's the problem. One problem. There's many problems. So what if there's no match? So it's entirely plausible that the pixel you're trying to find the disparity for is visible in the left view, but not visible in the right. That means that in the right view, that pixel is occluded because it's behind another object. Totally possible. And if you don't believe me, get a bunch of like cups, fill them with milk or maybe Pepsi cans or I don't know. Find a bunch of objects, put them on your desk and play that thumb trick and you'll actually see how these occlusion tricks are working. So one of the interesting problems is what if there's no match? So we would end up searching and um, we wouldn't find a match. And so our method would be like, I reached the edge of the right image, I didn't find a match, so what disparity do we assign this pixel? Because we couldn't find the corresponding value. So in many disparity algorithms, they will actually have a no disparity value to indicate we couldn't find a match. But that's not good enough, because if you're trying to do any algorithm that requires the depth of every pixel, then you have no depth for that pixel. You have no information whatsoever. So what some algorithms are going to try to do is infer a disparity based on the information around them to try to fill in these regions where we technically couldn't find a match. Now, there's other issues, too, in talking about what if no match exists. Well, what if there are slight variations in color between the left and right image? Now, you might be thinking, how could that happen if I have two camera lenses? And, I mean, it's just the same camera lens. Well, no, it's not. Um, e this is something the film industry is pr very particular about when capturing native, is that even camera lenses that have um, serial numbers such that they were produced 
like Cameron's A was produced and then immediately following Cameron's B was produced. So they're in the same batch, the same amount of glass and plastic. There's still going to be slight variations between those two lenses. Maybe their plastic wasn't mi mixed very well and there's a slight color difference. You never know what's gonna happen. It may be possible with this method of trying to match exactly that we can't find an exact match. So then you start having to wonder, okay, well, how much um, tolerance am I going to put into this matching? And so on and so forth. So that's just if you find no exact match. There's another problem that's even bigger. What if there's multiple matches? So we don't have, if you look at an image, each pixel is not a unique color. You are going to have the sky and the sky is all blue. If I take a picture here in my office, um, the wall is all this beigey color. Um, I'm going to have large regions of an image that are all the same color. So how then do I match a single pixel over there in the left image to a single option in the right image? Because there's multiple choices. So I can match with B2, I can match with B3, and I can match with B4. How do I know which one of those is the one that I should be matching to? This problem right here is a huge open problem in producing disparity maps. So if you're looking for a project idea for something where you can really help out, this is an area where you might want to do a bit more reading into. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, if I look back at this slide here, I would have known that B4 matches to B2 simply because if I look at the pixels around B4, there's only one tile or patch that matches. So I've got A3 and C3 is red and B3 is orange. And if I look at that, that only matches A1, B1, and C1 in the left right image. So Maybe instead of looking at an individual pixel, what we want to do is look at a block or a patch. So here we have a slightly different uh, image, zoomed in again, and I want to still match B4. So I've got three options for B4. I could match with B3, B2, or B1. But if we use, and that would be based on the scanline method. If instead of using the scanline method, what we're going to end up doing is not coming up with a match. Let's use instead the block method. Well, if I look at this block, this three by three neighborhood around P, then I can see it's very easy. You know, it's we're not going to match the first one, the second one, we match. Or the third one, we are going to match against B2. So here is our original block we're going to look at. So we're trying to find the match for B4 by using the whole area around B4. So I compare this patch in the left image to this patch or block in the right image, and I see they don't match very well. And then I shift again, and I see that this one doesn't match very well. And I shift again, and I find, oh, wait, we finally got the one that matches. And so now I know that this pixel here, centered at B2, these two patches match exactly, so now I can actually compute the disparity uh, between B4 and B2 as being two. All right, so you're, if you're sitting there thinking we've solved all of our problems, we really haven't. And the reason why we haven't, well, there's many reasons. So first off, we still have the problem of what if not just this pixel, but this entire block is occluded in the other image? So what if there is no match? So that's going to obviously cause us a problem. Problem one. Problem two, what if the patches don't match exactly? So what if you can't find an exact match in the right image? Well, then you have to start discussing, okay, well, what kind of tolerances I'm gonna build in? Am I gonna let there be, you know, an X percent tolerance uh, under certain circumstances? What am I going to permit here? 
Well, those two things, they're problems with many algorithms, but there's another huge problem with this block matching. Patterns. What if there's more than one match where the match is actually a pattern? So looking at this particular checkerboard here, and I know if you're looking at this checkerboard, you're probably like, why would you have a 3D photo that looks like this? Well, easy. What about taking a photo of a patterned floor or wallpaper? You're going to have multiple pattern matches. How do you choose the block that matches? Because I can match here and I also match here. Which one of these two patches is the correct match? We have no way of knowing at all because they're both identical matches. So again, we have no clue. All right. So how can you solve some of these little problems? Okay. So one of the things that you might think about doing is, well, let's take a larger block. So instead of doing a really small block, like just a three by three block, maybe you take a five by five or a six by six, take a bigger block and try to match that. Well, there's a problem with bigger blocks. The bigger blocks that you have, the more likely you are to include pixels from other disparities. And that's going to make it harder to find a matching block in the other image. So if you go too big, you're less likely to find a correct match. If you make the tolerance too big, then you may be matching against things that you shouldn't match against. Um, so this uh, choosing the correct block size is very, very difficult. Now, some methods will do something where they start with a really, really big block. And then if they can find a block that roughly matches, then they'll start narrowing it down to smaller and smaller blocks to see, okay, well, just how similar is this? And is the similarity centered around this pixel? That's one approach that you can take. And in fact, if you're looking at some in-painting algorithms uh, like patch match, they actually do things like that. They start with like really big blocks and then they actually can do refinement passes. Uh, all right, the other thing too, one of the problems that you have to be careful too is you don't want the pixel you're actually interested in to become just noise. Okay, so that's one thing that you could do to address it. Uh, another thing that, and we've talked about varying the level of detail. There are, by the way, many, many algorithms to do this. Uh, one that's pretty common is also, so there's graph cut, um, which is a popular method. Uh, another method that is popular is called semi-global or global block matching. And if you're using OpenCV to help you with this course, uh, OpenCV actually has block matching and semi-global block matching uh, algorithms implemented for you. Uh, so you're welcome to use those. Uh, another method that's common is belief propagation. So that is, we're going to try to estimate some of the states of unobserved variables in the system um, using the things that we do know. Uh, it's that some product message passing. And then there are many, many other things that people have done to guess disparities. So uh, one of the interesting places that finding depth maps shows up is actually an auto uh, stereoscopic converting TVs. So if you buy a 3D TV or a 3D monitor, they actually have built into the chipset the ability to take a 2D feed and turn it into a 3D one. And that means you're taking one image and they're on the fly turning it into 3D content, which means they're producing a depth map. Now conversion, proper conversion is a really long process and it's a very manual process. So what are these TVs doing? And could this be applied to guessing disparities? Um, Yes, it can be applied to guessing disparities. Uh, is it accurate? Not really. Does it sort of work for the TVs? Okay, I can't comment, but some people seem to think it's okay. So what are these methods? So one interesting method, uh, which is actually the conversion method that my, uh, my 3D monitor here uses, 
is that they are going to assign depth based on position. So they're assuming that anything at the bottom of the screen is in the foreground and anything at the top of the screen is in the background. So it's kind of like an angled plane where the bottom is closest to you and the top is furthest away. And I think it might actually be like an arc. I don't quite remember what it is. So that's one thing that people have done to estimate disparity or create depth. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying it looks bad. It's just, it's kind of a weird idea. Another one that I've seen is people made an observation that objects that are closer to you tend to have warm hues and objects that are further away from you tend to have cool hues. So reds and tans because people that you're focusing on would be in your foreground. And so they'll assign that disparities or depths that are closer to you and things that are cool blue shades, we'll assume is like mountains in the background and assign uh, disparities really far away from you. Okay, big problem. What if I have a blue car in the foreground and a red car in the background? Then they would have the wrong depths. So it's not that there aren't other means to estimate what the disparity or depth is. It's just that some of them don't work very well, although certainly have and are still used. And if you're wondering, how do I know about these two methods down here? This color-based one was presented in a conference many years ago not that many, maybe six years ago. And uh, this position-based one, as I said, is what my, uh, the conversion method that my 3D monitor uses. We've gotten better, by the way. All right. So we've talked about some of the complications with uh, producing a disparity map. And you might think that's all the complications, but we've barely scratched the surface on complications with disparity. Um, so we've got things like, what if there's no match? So how do we handle occlusions, which is mentioned on this slide? We've also got issues of what if there's multiple matches? What if there's multiple patch matches? What if the tolerance is too high? There's all kinds of issues related there, but there's additional complications that make producing a disparity map really, really hard. And one of them is the rectification of the input images. So what do I mean by rectification? Well, if you take a stereo photo, I'm just looking for my stereo camera here, even though I don't have batteries in it right now. So if you take a stereo photo, it's really important that your left and right lenses or your left and right ca um, cameras are perfectly aligned level and horizontal. Because if you try to take a stereo photo like this, you're going to have a bad time. Um, that's going to not, when you actually see the photos side by side, they'll be square, but because the images, the contents on an angle itself, they won't line up. That is, if you look at this rose image here, which I manipulated in stereo photomaker, um, I muddled the rectification. So what you can see here, if we're looking at this thick white line, all the pixels that are underneath that white line in the left image should their matches should be underneath that white line in the right image. But you can see that the right image is a little bit higher than the left. And since our brains are trying to perform this fusion using scan lines effectively, if the match isn't on that same horizontal scan line, then our brain can't find the match and we'll have um, a fusion problem. It will be in it will give us discomfort. Now that also means the disparity map algorithms, these, this special case of the correspondence method, we're only searching left and right. We're only searching along that scan line. We don't tend to search up and down too much. So if your images are not rectified, then the disparity map methods won't be able to find the corresponding pixel because it's simply not on that scan line or near that scan line. So, and there's also issues with barrel roll, like maybe one of the images rotated, or uh, maybe it's got a bit of keystoning. There's all kinds of different rectification issues that we can have. Maybe it's scale. The point is that before 
you can actually run a disparity map method, you need to rectify the image. So you're going to need to actually make sure that everything is lined up. You're going to need to make sure that there's no rotations. You're going to need to going to make sure that there's no barrel rolls or keystoning. So you're going to have to do some pre-processing of your stereo photo before you can even attempt to do a disparity uh, method on it. Again, I like to use Stereo Photo Maker for that, but sometimes I find Photoshop to be quite useful for this as well. Um, and if you don't have a Photoshop license, the GIMP can work too. Okay, so rectification is kind of the first problem that you need to solve. Uh, part of that rectification process as well, I want to point out is color. That one's not so obvious because even if your two images are perfectly rectified in terms of everything, like they actually line up and there's no rotations, you can still have differences in color, like big differences in color. Um, and if you have a problem with color, then any of these matching algorithms simply wouldn't work because the color would be off. So we wouldn't be able to find a match. So you need to make sure that the colors and the exposures and the positioning of the two images matches up as closely as possible before you run the disparity algorithm. Now, I've actually had a lot of problems with this. So one of the 3D projects that I worked on many years ago was with these 100-year-old uh, World War I photos. And I showed you some of those in the last episode. I will post some of them for you, by the way, so you can play with them if you want. The problem is these photos are 100 years old. They were taken with 100-year-old stereo cameras. You can imagine that a 100-year-old stereo camera on a battlefield is not going to be the ideal condition for taking a 3D photo. And so there, the rectification of those images is just terrible. And so before we were able to generate the disparity maps for those photos, we actually had to put them through many different kinds of correction, correcting exposures, correcting um, rotations, because that was a really big one. We were also correcting contrasts. I had one where someone had tried to colorize the left, but not the right. Uh, there was just some really bizarre things going on. And then on top of that, because these had been kept in an archive somewhere for a hundred years, these color plates or these photo plates actually had like scratches and damage that was different. And so we had to try to correct that before we could even run the disparity method. Stereo 3D is hard. There's a lot of things you have to take into consideration. All right, so let's assume that you have some beautifully rectified images. We still have that problem of occlusion, and this is a ray traced photo again. This is one where I can actually post for you uh, as additional 3D content to play with for your projects. So here we have these cups. And the problem is, so in the left eye, we can just barely see this one cup right here. Um, but in the right, view, we would actually be able to see more of that cup. But the cup that's on the left side, we would be able to see less of that cup. So because there are regions that are occluded by the left that would not, or things that are not occluded by the left that would be occluded by the right, how do we actually solve that matching? Now, as I said before, many stereo um, disparity map matching algorithms actually just set it to can't find, but there are some newer algorithms which actually try to infer based on the region around them. Oh look, all my pixels here, <laughs> they all had this disparity and oh look, they're roughly the same part of the image so maybe I should fill that color in there. So that's a big problem. This is another one which is actually still the problem of occlusion, but it's a bigger problem. It's, it's a much harder thing to solve. So what you see here is I have this red box and this blue box. The red box is the left image and the blue box is the right image. And what you're seeing here in the middle is the overlap. So that is the region of the left image that overlaps with the region of the right image. So everything in the left that's in this middle part here is visible in the right. Occlusions aside. But what you'll notice is off to the left here, we have a solid pink area that's only visible in the left. And in the right image, we have the solid blue area that's only visible in the right. How do you compute the depth or disparity 
of these large regions at the edges that are only visible in that image. So this in itself is a complicated problem because you're not trying to fill in some thin slivers along the edge of an object that's in this middle region, which you can reasonably intelligently guess what the disparity of those occluded regions are. The problem with the edges is that you don't have any information at all because that entire block of the image is not going to match with anything in the other side. So how do you handle this? Now, again, there are some algorithms which simply don't, that's very common, but there's other algorithms these, and there's other algorithms which just chop them off. Don't do that. Um, so what do you do with these edges? Well, some people are now trying to figure out, okay, can I, is this object in this edge region, is that something that is visible in part in the middle? And can I infer anything about what is visible to help me fill in this region here? So we're trying to be a lot more intelligent with these image edges region. Um, but if you're looking at something like the semi-global block matching in OpenCV or basic scanline methods, you're going to see that they just ignore these regions altogether. All right, so then let's suppose that you've managed to acquire, you've got your stereo photo and you've found some method online that you want to use to produce your disparity map. And now you want to know, or let's suppose that you've created your own disparity map generating algorithm and you want to know how good is it? So you need some method to validate your results. And in order to validate your results, you need to know the ground truth. That is, you need to know the actual disparity. So how do you actually get the ground truth for uh, an image? So I've already showed you before, but you could actually use ray traced images and get ray traced disparity maps. And kind of the trick here to doing this, now I actually took my ray tracer from CS488 and <laughs> It's a little buggy, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I modified it to, to support a stereo camera and to actually produce disparity. But what you're kind of going to do is uh, you start with the left image to get the disparity. And what I'm going to do is for each pixel I render in the left, I'm going to then set from the intersection point on the object, I am then going to see where does that pixel um, intersect the right image plane going from the point of intersection on the object as I got from the left eye and then from that point to the right eye. So I'm using the epipolar geometry. So I'm bouncing from left to focal point and then bouncing from the focal point back to the left and then finding out where along that scan line did that ray intersect the image plane. And then I just compute the difference in those two positions and there's the disparity. And then I'll do the same for the right, right? It works kind of. Uh, if you would find it helpful, I can post the code, but please do keep in mind that the code for this, the original ray tracer, which is the bulk of the code that you would see was written in 2006 when I was an undergrad. <laughs> so it's like 14 years old. Um, I mean, I can post it if you find it useful. Now there is a tiny flaw in the disparity map generation algorithm for the most part, though it produces almost flawless maps. All right, so you could modify a ray tracer. My understanding is if you have access to Pavray, uh, I think you can very quickly modify Pavray as well to also give you the disparity maps. Uh, I ended up not using Pavray because I had a ray tracer already and manipulating that epipolar geometry just seemed so easy that I just went with that instead of trying to learn how to manipulate Pavray and then make it do it. All right, also because I already had a bulk of scenes designed for my own ray tracer, it just made sense. So let's suppose you don't want to ray trace. Let's suppose you want to actually take a stereo photo and actually while you're taking the stereo photo, you want to actually measure the depth. There are various methods to do this. Uh, cameras like the Lytro, which have instead of a singular lens or two lenses, they have hundreds of lenses. They have techniques for estimating depth 
from the myriad of images they get from each of the lenses. But a very common method for estimating depth, which is used by things like the Microsoft Connect, it's used by all different kinds of different depth-based cameras, is called structured lighting. And this is how it works. Um, you're going to have usually an infrared cam emitter or multiple infrared emitters or some kind of non-human visible light emitter on the front of the camera device. And it is going to, and you can see it here, it shines out a pattern of light. And it's usually a dot pattern. So you can see here there's uh, this pattern of infrared dots. And then the idea is, in addition to having a regular camera, they also have an infrared sensor. So they are going to emit a dot pattern of infrared light that they know what that pattern looks like. And then they're going to sense the, that pattern as it shines onto the surfaces in your room. And then it's going to compare the expected pattern with the pattern that it recorded. And then based on the distortions of the pattern it recorded, i.e. the distance between the dots um, and what dots are visible and what dots are not, it can actually create, oh, here's what the depth must be at this particular location. So the Connect uses this structured lighting approach. And another group of people that use the structured lighting approach is Middlebury. So the Middlebury data set, their disparity maps were actually produced using structured lighting. Uh, it's a very, as I said, it's a very, very common thing to do. And if you're looking at most depth-based cameras, um, a good percentage of them are using uh, structured lighting to estimate the depth. And it does work pretty well, and it's pretty easy. Uh, of course, with infrared light, you're going to deal with heat sources as being problems and so on and so forth. Um, so what are your other options? Well, there aren't a lot of other options. So another thing I want to talk to you about is, so what do these disparity maps look like in progress? So you, you know that the ground truth, you could get this. This is a ray traced one here and it's beautiful, right? It's perfect. Middlebury's disparity maps. If we go back over here to the Middlebury page, you know, let's click on one of these. It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn close. The black regions, by the way, here are uh, occluded regions where they weren't able to, to estimate the depth. So normally when I work with a Middlebury set, what I do is I drop this into Photoshop or GIMP, and then I take all of these occluded regions and I just fill them in with something that looks reasonable. Um, <laughs> no, that's not accurate, but we have no information there and we need information there, so I have to fill it in with something. So whether you've got structured lighting disparity maps or a ray trace disparity map, those are your options for ground truth, and they're going to look pretty good. So what do disparity maps look like in practice? Hmm. I, the ones you get from the algorithms that you're going to apply, like global block matching in OpenCV. This is what they look like, and I'm sure in the video this is not terribly clear. So this uh, image in the upper left corner is the disparity map that was computed using a belief propagation method, uh, which unfortunately I can't produce the paper for you because it is a, uh, belongs to Adobe. <laughs> um, but it, this method actually did really good for this rose photo compared to the others, except this is also absolutely terrible. So why is this such a bad disparity map here? This isn't even the worst one I have. I, I grabbed one that was kind of middle of the pack. I can tell that there's like a rose-ish, flower-ish thing in here. Um, what's wrong with it? Well, first off, looking here at the upper left petal, you'll see here in the photo that the upper left petal is a nice, uh, a triangular shape, almost a, almost a square. But if you look at the corresponding region in the disparity map, you'll notice it looks like somebody took a bite out of it. That's going to be a problem. As some of you may have read in our stereopsis section, it's part, the biggest 
thing our visual system uses to do the matching or one of the things that's most important is actually having the edges match. Okay, well our edges don't match here. <laughs> so we have a really big problem with this disparity map. Um, other problems that you can see here are we've got really, aside from just noisy edges, you'll see there's just noisy blobs all over the place in the rest. That doesn't really make sense. We've got a lot of streaking going on. And again, that doesn't make sense. And that's simply where the method was, oh, just, I can't quite match this. I believe it's close to that. And it just ends up getting propagated. Now, one of the things that was interesting about this belief propagation technique is it used the belief propagation system to actually fill in the left image with the left strip. So it's, it's kind of dragged into it, but that's better than nothing. So this is what you should anticipate you get if you are running the disparity map on a 3D photo you take. <laughs> now you might be like, but I went to the Middlebury page and if you do go to the Middlebury page, there's more than just data sets here. There's something else that's super, super important. So if you click on the evaluation tab at the top, this actually is, I want to say the de facto standard for where do all the disparity algorithms stand so far in competition with each other. And they have listed methods here going back in time and papers that haven't even been accepted yet. It's just kind of accepted that you're going to take your method and you're going to compare it using their online system to everybody else's. So if we look at here, these are the current champions. So we've got this NOS Rob. So they've got different scores and there's lots of documentation on the website that explains what all of these scores are. They use different, um, image sets. So this particular evaluation, this is version three of the evaluation, uses their most recent data, which is really nice data actually, because it's got a lot of skinny objects and skinny objects are notoriously difficult, <laughs> like hair, uh, wires, a fern, really tricky stuff. Um, you can actually see here the quality it produces and it'll actually show you on the right hand side what the errors were and what the disparity map looked like. So at the top, you're actually seeing disparity maps that look pretty, pretty nice. And then as you go down to the bottom, we're going back to, oh my God, what is that? That's so horrible. It doesn't even look like the image. <laughs> Sorry, I was getting dramatic there. Um, so, yee, yucky, right? That, that, is what you should anticipate you get when you just run this meth these methods on regular photos. Um, I want to warn you, you might be thinking if I download this one with Nasrab, and by the way, they always link the papers, which is really great. So you can actually go and read the paper and you can maybe find the code for it. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, I'll go download Nasrab. And, or I'll go implement this NOS Rob and then I'll run it on a bunch of random 3D photos and it's going to give me the same quality that I see here on the Middlebury website. And I wanna warn you, um, that's not usually the case. These, because the Middlebury data set is kind of the de facto standard for testing stereo algorithms, I feel like a lot of algorithms have been optimized for the Middlebury data set. And then when you take some random 3D photo, even if you think you've rectified it as perfectly as possible, um, you end up getting garbage um, or something that doesn't even come close to matching the quality you get out of the Middlebury set. So if you are looking at running your own disparity map uh, code or downloading one of these methods that's listed here in the, this lovely list and then using it yourself, my recommendation to you is to also first Make sure you have it working on your computer. Um, use the data set that they use. So download in this case, this is I think the 2014 data set for Middlebury. Um, so download that and run the method on that test set to make sure that you've got all, all of everything configured correctly. You've got the parameters, you understand them correctly. And only then once you're convinced you've got it working on your own computer on the Middlebury set, then try it on a stereo photo because 
if you can't get it working prop the way they're claiming on the Middlebury site, on the Middlebury data set, then there's a possibility that the code is broken or you're not using it correctly. There's a million things that could be wrong. So do be careful. Um, and don't ever expect you're going to get beautiful results. <clears throat> so even when I get really good results with Middlebury, I usually find that my stereo photos come out really, really terrible. All right. So on the discussion of terrible disparity maps, what if you're trying to run an algorithm that requires a disparity map and actually requires it to be nice, which is like every method out there, as we'll discuss in the next section. What are you going to do? <clears throat> um, <laughs> correct it in post. So right now, this would be a very manual process. So you would generate your um, disparity map using whichever method you choose from the Middlebury side or OpenCV. MATLAB, by the way, uh, also has methods. So if your supervisor has access to a MATLAB license, or you have access to MATLAB from for some other reason, uh, the most recent versions of MATLAB do have disparity map code. Um, but what are you going to do with your disparity map once you've got it and realized that it's got a lot of mistakes in it? How are you going to crisp up those edges? How are you going to get rid of the excess noise? How are you going to fill in the areas where it couldn't find any disparity? So the default thinking for many people is to take it into Photoshop or GIMP and manually fix it. That's a pain. I've done that. <laughs> um, the image that you're seeing here is actually something that I did uh, a few years ago, and I only have a prototype of it. So this is an open project. And if you're interested in doing this for your final project, by all means, please do contact me because we do have some starter code that some of my URIs have been working on. Um, but what this method is, is we take the stereo image and we take the disparity map and we're going to try to make some corrections to the disparity map after you've created it. Now you might be wondering how are we knowing which things we need to correct? Well we made a simple observation and I made this observation is it eight years ago, nine years ago, seven years ago and that is if you're looking at any stereo photos or just life in general keeping in mind of course that I am stereo blind but what, what I, I observe is that in an area of the scene where the color doesn't vary greatly, like this wall back here, well, the color isn't varying greatly, but neither is the depth. So if the depth did vary greatly, like let's say there was a hole in the wall or a corner here, then we would actually see a big change in color. Now, I know that's not entirely true. It's, it's very much lighting dependent. But generally speaking, if there was a huge change in the depth of this wall or the shape of this wall, that would correspond to a big changes in the color. So to produce this little image you see here on this slide, what we did is I segmented the input photo by color, almost quantizing by color, uh, we did do some edge segmentation. And then after we've done a segmentation of the image, we find the corresponding region of the disparity map. And then we did some statistical analysis of the disparities in that region to identify, first off, which pixels do we believe have the correct disparity? And there's different rules that you can apply there. And then which pixels do we believe have the wrong disparity? And then for the pixels we believe are incorrect, we use something like ransack plane fitting to fill in those that we don't believe work. Now this method I used to produce this disparity map here obviously did a reasonable job. I mean, look at this. This is all noisy. We can't identify any of the objects or the internal structures of the flowers. And look at it on the right. We've got nice crisp petals. We've got internal structures to the flower. I can tell that there's leaves, the noise and the streaking, it's all gone. So this method worked really well, but the dirty secret is that when I was at Adobe doing this research, this actually wasn't the goal of our research. We were doing something else. And this was just something I did one afternoon to solve a problem for something else. Um, so it's very ad hoc and I don't have the source code to it. Although I do have the patent on the idea and I can post the patent to Piazza if you're interested in it. 
Um, but it would be really nice to go back and actually really improve and take the ad hoc behavior of this and do something nice. Because being able to correct a disparity map in post is actually a massively useful tool. All right, so you've gotten, I think, a pretty good idea now of what the disparity maps are and how you would produce a disparity map, but also some of the challenges associated with the production of these disparity maps. You know how to get a ground truth disparity map, um, and you've seen how bad they can be. And as I said, this isn't the worst. Um, here, you know what? I'll show you a worse one. So let me just see if I can find a worse one. I'm not sure I have a worse one. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, stereo tests, lilies. There you go. <laughs> so if, I haven't shown you what photo this is for. Um, this again was using a belief propagation method, which is actually a pretty decent method. Um, but I'm gonna guess and say that if you're sitting there at home looking at this, you can't guess what this is a photo of. So let me show you what the photo is. That's the photo. So now that you've seen the photo, I mean, you can kind of see we've got some of these lily petals here, but it's just absolute noise. So if you see stuff like this, that's not unexpected, um, which is why generally speaking, when we're trying to test things, we stick to a lovely Middlebury data set because the photos are pre-rectified. They've been taken with a certain separation in mind and so on and so forth. All right, so I'm going to leave that there for today. Um, you'll have another one of these introductory topic lectures in a few weeks, and I'll post the date a little bit closer to the time. Our next episode is going to cover manipulation of stereo images. So we're going to look at uh, things like how do we adjust the depth of a stereo image? We will look at how do you remove objects from a stereo image? How do you add objects at a particular depth to a stereo image? And how do you do things like stylize the stereo image? Because if you look at a lot of movies, things like Requiem for, no, not Requiem for a Dream. That's a different movie. Uh, what Dreams May Come, I think it is. Uh, they actually do things like create a painterly style. Well, what if we want to extend that painterly style to stereo 3D? How do we actually do that while making it comfortable for our viewers? Um, so our next uh, little section after this, so section three is going to talk about stereo manipulation. All right, so I'll leave it there and I'm gonna post some more content, of course, to Piazza, uh, more stereo images and some other cool, cool things. So we will see you next time.